our feet. So we're ready to praise our God this morning. Come on. Come on, let's sing this. We're staring into your eyes makes my heart come alive. Suddenly brought to life when I met you. Reaching me on the skies, running deep, stretching wide. Perfect love realized here with you. Come on, sing. This love is for real, you will never let go, never let go. It's more than just words, love beyond my control, out of control. Well, this is real love, this is real love. Oh, this is real love, this is real love. grateful for the love of our God this morning. That's a little more like it. That's good. Well, the Bible says this in uh, John chapter 8. It says, If you hold to my teaching, then you are really my disciples. And then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It says, Very truly I tell you, everyone who is sins is a slave to sin. And a slave has no permanent place in the family. But a son or a daughter belongs to it forever. So if the sun sets you free, then you will be free indeed. And so this morning, if you feel away from God, that's an invitation to draw near to Him this morning. And if you are in Christ, then the promise is that you have a place. There's a place for you in the Father's house this morning, that you are free, you're free indeed. That means we have freedom this morning to step into the presence of God with boldness. We have freedom to cast off any restraints and freedom to enter His presence. Amen. So as we worship, let's do that this morning. Come on. Can we 
sin Who am I that the highest king would welcome me I was lost but he brought me Oh his love for me Oh his love for me Come on we lift it up Who the sun sets free Come on Oh it's free for 
sing at church to our precious Jesus. says that God's mercies are new every day, every day. No matter how we woke up, no matter how we finished yesterday, no matter what the challenge, the struggle, no matter what's in front of us, all the opportunities, the success, the failures, no matter what it is, this is a new day. And God wants to do something new in all of us. Something great, something amazing. We're gonna take a moment and pray for so many different situations here. We are. We've got Darwin, Hillsong Darwin with us. 
as well. So one of you guys, why don't you jump up on the stage and hold up the prayer request as well. Heard you crushed it in Bali Friday night, Jared. So exciting. Lots of things here. All those that are on Church of the Air already tuned in with us from the beginning of the service as well. Why don't we pray about all these different things and maybe even just surrender afresh today, yourself, your own life, for God to do something unique, individually, for you, for no, no, nobody else, for you. What could God do today in our lives, drawing us, bringing us closer? Come on, can we lift our hands toward heaven? All these needs today. Father, we thank You for every person. We thank You, Lord, for who You are. We thank You for Your goodness and Your grace, Lord. All those that are out in cattle stations around Australia, all those that are in Darwin right now, those here in Sydney, anyone who's on Hillsong Channel, Lord, right now, live streamed across the earth. Father, we thank You for every person. We thank You for Your grace. We thank You for Your presence, Lord. And every single need here, God, we ask You again to do something miraculous. May Your presence invade our lives, Lord. May Your great grace and Your strength change us, help us, save us, restore us. Do something great because Yours is the name above every name. And we worship You. We honour You this morning in Jesus' Name. Great to have you in church this morning. Welcome to Hillsong. Wherever you are, wherever you are across the planet, it's so nice to have you with us, all those that are streamed in, and especially those Church of the Air, out in cattle stations around Australia, remote places. Welcome. It's great to have you with us every Sunday morning. It's nice. Good job. Good job. Can we take a moment while we're standing and just pray for Pastor Brian's book? He is about to go on tour after Easter. Um, we, we got it a little bit early in our church, which is one of the privileges of being Hillsong, but um, it, went, it went on sale out around the world throughout the week last week. And I just thought it'd be nice for us as a church Brian's out there leading on the edge and this book um, there is more it's actually a really biblical concept because God has more for everybody and it's so easy to live less and live small and live I guess behind the curtain of what God would love for us to see and be revealed and it'd be nice if we just pray right now for not, not just for the book for the book to go out and for people to turn to Jesus and for people to pick up the Bible be inspired through reading this to pick up the Bible and let's pray for Brian to be strengthened. After Easter, he goes into a whole lot of different cities around the US and just for God's strength and grace to be on him. So Father, we thank you for Pastor Brian and we thank you for this book that you've enabled him to write. And Lord, we're excited about it as a church, but Lord, we just ask that somehow people who pick this up, who read it, Lord, would be drawn to you ultimately, would be drawn to your book, God, to, to the Bible. And Lord, as Brian's preparing and getting ready, not just for Easter, but for this tour, Lord. We ask that you'd strengthen him and bless him indeed, Lord. May, may your strength and your grace be upon his life to carry this thought all the way through, days and days that are in front of him. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's nice. Very good. Well, listen, we are going to dedicate some children to the Lord this morning. So we're going to put 60 seconds on the clock, let you guys say hi to each other. But all those parents that have got kids, we're going to dedicate. Why don't you come up on the stage now? Bring your children up. All right, why don't we grab a seat? We've got some amazing families here this morning. We're going to dedicate some children to the Lord. If you are family or friends of any of these people up here, feel free to come on down the front here. Take a little family snap. We wanna introduce you to some of these, well, all of these children. Baby dedications. The reason we dedicate children to the Lord, it's a little bit different to baptising in water. Uh, we have water baptisms 
next Sunday morning, Easter Sunday. Can you believe it's Easter next weekend? We're going to baptise people next Sunday morning on Resurrection Sunday. But we dedicate children to the Lord because these kids are not old enough to choose Jesus for themselves yet. And so it's a parent's responsibility to dedicate their children to the Lord and raise them up in God's ways. And then when the kids are old enough, hopefully, they'll make the right choice, choose Jesus. But we need to introduce these families, these kids here. They're gorgeous. And normally I would have Pastor Bobby up here, but she's on her way flying. She's about to leave. So I thought, while well, mum's gone, why don't you help me? Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Who have we got? Okay, we have Ivella. Ivella, which I'm told you say Vella for short. She's beautiful, lovely. This is a tough gig, by the way. Okay, and here we have Harper. Hi, Harper. Do you want to say hi? Good talk, good talk. Okay, hi, Jude. Jude, say hi, everyone. Can you wave? Yes, you can. <laughs> Not today? All right. I get it, I get it. Okay, and here we have Finn. Yes! Hi, Finn. Lovely. Hey, do you want to say anything? Nope. <laughs> and Alexa, look at this dress, beautiful. Do you want to say hello? Yes. Nope. <laughs> All right. And lastly, Andrik? Alaric. Look at that hair, guys. Hair goals right there. You need to put that baby on Pinterest. Everyone will be going to the hairdresser asking for that hairstyle. Amazing, beautiful. It's so great. Why don't we stand, church? It's a great honour. What a gift it is to be able to have children and an honour for us to pray. Laura, would you like to pray? We want to pray for these families and especially these kids as we dedicate them to the Lord. Thanks for being with us today. This is very special. Why don't you reach out your hands towards these kids and the families, the parents. Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to parent these children, to lead them in the ways of the Lord. And I just thank you right now for each child. I thank you that your hand is upon them, that your grace and your favour is upon them. Lord, I pray for the parents that they would um, sense your Spirit leading them and guiding them and directing them every step of the way in each new day, in each new joy and triumph and every challenge, every single moment that they come upon, Lord, that you would be with with them, Lord Jesus. And so we ask that You would walk alongside them and that You would um, just, just give Your grace to them, Your favour upon them in Jesus' Name. We thank You, Lord Jesus, for them, for the gift that they are. Amen. 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 I love it. It's so great. Listen, we've got a, a baby dedication certificate for you, right there for each of you, and also a Bible that you can read with the kids, so that's yours. And there's also a, a morning tea for you guys and for family and friends that's in the Western Cafe just around the corner there after the service. So why don't we give them one more great big congratulations. Thanks for helping, Laura. You guys can be seated. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, families. It's beautiful. Can you believe it's Easter next weekend? Next weekend, the last couple of years, Pastor Brian has been on location. We go live from somewhere around the world and it's next week, who knows? Somewhere special, he could be here, he could be somewhere else. We won't know until Friday or Sunday, will we? That's right. It's gonna be cool. Okay, we're gonna receive our giving this morning, our tithes. So all those on Church of the Air, those in Darwin here, why don't we get ready? There's different ways that you can give on the screen. Uh, you might wanna use the app. Lots of people are doing that online, whichever way is helpful to you, convenient to you. I'm gonna ask a very special man, Jad Gillies. Jad Gillies. Jad's a great guy, part of Hillsong United, um, but he loves our church, he loves you. He loves you, he loves Australia, loves you. Yes, he does, he's gonna encourage us this morning. Thanks, Chad. Thank you, Joel. How's everybody doing? All right, well, it's a privilege for me to speak to you and 
and encourage you around your giving, I just want to uh, read from Luke 21. You guys know this story because it's a famous woman, but we don't know her name. Um, it, it says in, in verse 21, uh, sorry, in verse 1, and he looked up and saw the rich putting in their gifts into the treasury. And he also saw a certain poor woman putting in two mites. He said, truly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all. For all, these, for all these out of the abundance have put in offerings for God, but she out of her poverty put in all the livelihood that she had. You know, the word uh, obedience, it's not the most sexy word in the church landscape. Would you agree? <laughs> yep, I did it. But this woman in her obedience managed to get Jesus' attention which is a stark contrast to how I grew up because it was usually my disobedience that got my dad's attention. And no one, can anyone else relate? No one? I know JD relates totally. <laughs> but I love the fact that in her obedience, she got Jesus' attention. Now it wasn't about how much she gave and it wasn't about her means, but it was about having a heart to please God. And I think that I think that that's an amazing thing to be inspired by. And I want to be somebody who gets Jesus' attention. Obviously, this is, this is a free will um, thing. Uh, if you're new or you're a visitor, you're under no compulsion to give. But those who have a conviction to build God's house, I want to encourage you that it's, it's our obedience that, that gets God's attention. And uh, so as you prepare and as, you, and, and as, you, as, you, as the buckets go by, um, just remember that, just remember that... Um, that he wants actually to, 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 he wants to give us his attention and we, and we can do that. Uh, we had an amazing week at Colour last week and uh, so turn your eyes to the screen and uh, see some of the highlights. Stand by everyone. Starting in five. Cue music, cue lights. It's wonderful being in such a vibrant environment. We always find it so much fun. is that we will be found, that we will go from strength to strength, that we will be found Holy Spirit wind in our sails. And the oh, funny those amazing. comedy things they have at the beginning, the will they be having bits? that again? <laughs> DJ, keep that going, because we're about to do the big reveal. Well, that to me says risen, empowered, and beautiful to us. <laughs> you wouldn't want to live with them, would you? Am I on? You never told me about funny stuff. Well, I, I, just in case there wasn't. Oh, OK. <laughs> If you're going to be these Proverbs 31 women, Jesus Christ is going to be your true north. Live in constant expectation. Here's a major lesson. God doesn't mind your tears, but He wants your tears to be used. You might cry, but then there's a time when it's time to stop crying and it's time to start building your future. Every day, stand in front of that mirror at home, know that you are created in the image of God and proclaim what the Psalmist did. I am marvelously made. You are God's artwork, you are His finest creations. And He has created you anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things that He has planned for us long ago. Who is the light of the world? If you said Jesus, that's true, but who else is the light of the world? You are. You are the light of the world, shining into the darkest places. No matter how painful the loss, no matter how difficult it seems, no matter how easy it would be to get angry with God, loss can become power because God shows up in loss. 
where the Spirit of truth is, there is freedom, there is liberty, there is life in Jesus' Name. Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. Amen. How fun was colour, hey? I know there's a whole bunch of girls that were down here from Darwin as well, and it was special. And as a guy, there weren't many of us in the room because it's a girls' conference, but for the few of us that were, you watch that highlights reel, and it, it just all the memories come back of how amazing that conference was, and uh, you know, Charlotte was incredible, and Bob Goff was just insane. You know those push bikes all around the city that are just getting left and discarded? You know, especially downtown, man, those yellow bikes are just trashed everywhere. Bob Goff said, Someone used to love those bikes. So where's Blake? Apparently, apparently he said, is that true that he said he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't let you drive him to the conference? They had to jump on push bikes and put balloons on them because he, he felt so sad that the push bikes were just left all over, littered all over the city. So he jumped on push bikes and rode himself to conference. That guy's a hoot. Listen, there's a special, special announcement to make for Colour Conference next year. And that is for the last few years, we've been running two conferences. One of them is a weekend conference, which is Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And the other one's the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And obviously the weekend one's more popular because you only have to take one day off. Well, next year, they are both weekend conferences. Girls, it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, both conferences. So choose whichever one you want. They're identical, they're exactly the same, and you can get into either one of those and it's both weekend conferences. Check out out there. Uh, you can register at the info desk or just jump online. It's probably the easiest way to do it. Why don't you check the screens one more time and have a look at church news. Easter is coming. I think There Is More has got to be one of the greatest titles for a book because in essence, it's the theme of Christianity. Pastor Brian's had a huge impact on us, so we will be forever grateful for his empowerment and releasing us into all God wants us to do. There's always going to be more. There's always more around the corner. There is so much more. God has more for all of us. This is the book to find that out. Condom 
condemnation died so that freedom could live. He doesn't point the finger and remind you of your mistakes and your failures and your past. He comes with open arms. It's the resurrected life of Jesus that brings liberty and life to you. Yes, 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 next weekend. Okay, if you promise not to leave at the end of the service, I'll tell you what's happening next weekend, all right? Because I want to get to the preaching of the Word. Preaching, the preaching, God's Word this morning. We are blessed. Peter Toganavalu. Peter and Laura are a great, great family, great couple in the life of our church. And they look after all of our youth ministry, young and free. And it's doing very, very well. And it's uh, something that mums and dads, we feel very, very safe because we can trust you guys with our kids and we're grateful for what you do. Togs, he's a great preacher. He's a great man of God. He's awesome. He really is. We are at a wedding on Friday night. Taya Smith got married to Ben G. Um, It's going to be Taya G now. Taya G. And... Um, The father of the bride, Taylor Smith's dad, got up and was thanking all these different people and thanking Hillsong United because Taylor's part of United and then is going around thanking people for being there and says thank you to Laura and um, and he couldn't remember Peter's name. He says thank you to Laura and thank you to Mr. Laura. (laughs) So can we stand this morning and welcome Mr. Laura as he comes to preach. Good morning, church. Mr. Laura, nice to meet you. Are you well? Well, you look well, and I'm pumped to bring the Word this morning, and uh, I'm going to pray in a moment, and then we're going to get straight into it. Is that okay? So, Father, I thank you so much, Lord, that you're here. God, you're doing something amazing, God. You're, you're moving in people's lives. You're my spirit's here, God, and Lord, I thank you for family. I thank you for community. I thank you, God, for the church, Lord, that it is advancing, and Lord, you're building it. And so we thank you that you allow us to partner with you to do that. And so, God, I pray this word would bless people, and uh, even the people that think the youth pastor, what's he going to have to say here? I pray it will bless them as well. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. That's for you, Maddie. Grad. Grab your seats, tap the person next to you and tell them you're one of the good ones. <laughs> so honoured to bring the word this morning. And uh, it's always an honour to stand on any of our platforms, whether that's in front of high schoolers, university students, college students, or whether it's you incredible people. It's always an honour uh, to declare God's word to you, incredible, good-looking bunch. You are good-looking. Do you know that? Amen. Well, I want you to call this message (coughs) Monologues and Dialogues. Monologues and Dialogues. Does anyone remember when you were a kid or a teenager, or maybe there's teenagers here, uh, you used to get frustrated with something. So today, teenagers get frustrated with their iPhone uh, because it's not loading fast enough, because uh, the Wi-Fi connection's not working, because they can't text their boyfriend or their girl, and so life's all over, um, because uh, uh, the, the phone's so slow. To which your parents or our parents would look at that and say, oh, you young people. <laughs> Do you remember this? And maybe it happened when you were a teenager. Oh, you young people. And the monologue would begin back in my day. Do you remember this? Back in my day, uh, oh, when I used to have to get in contact with your mom, I would call a pigeon. (laughs) Roll up my message, put it in the pigeon. The pigeon would fly away and then maybe I'll hear back from your mom. Or maybe you were like my parents who who might be here somewhere and they would tell me of how they used to get to school. They would walk five kilometers, then they would swim another 20 and (laughs) they would climb Mount Everest, run through the forest, wrestle some wolves in comparison to what 
You do today, you take five minute bus ride. You know, we, we do this as parents. It's funny, because I do this today with my, my uh, eight year old, and I'm like, I sound exactly like my parents here. And we talk about it back, you know, back in the day, but do you, do you remember rolling your eyes as they began their monologue? You probably responded with, oh, here we go again. Monologues, it's one man speaking, one person speaking, their speech, their opinion. It's them, no one else has, don't, don't, don't interrupt the monologue because it's just about one person speaking. I used to do drama in school and uh, I know, uh, yeah, right? Um, <laughs> I used to do drama, why are you surprised? Um, and uh, I was great at monologues. Someone's like, that's no surprise there. Um, I used to do monologues and I was great at monologues, memorizing my lines. I was terrible uh, at dialogue because you had to listen to the other person. And I remember one time I was doing a, a dialogue piece and I, I forgot my lines and I said the wrong line. And you know, they're, they're, they have someone in like, that sits behind the stage that yells out your line. I've messed the whole play up. Romeo and Juliet it went downhill real fast. And uh, because I was terrible at dialogue. Well, I say all that to say this. I think this is indicative of our society, our culture, even the everyday Christian. Because we get caught up in our monologues. We love our monologues. We love our opinion. We love our belief. We love to vent and we love to let everyone know what we're thinking and our opinion. We live in the digital age of blogyouropinion.com. Keyboard warrior. Comment and caption, 140 characters. We live in the world of policies and procedures. We love our policies and procedure. And I tell you what, as a youth pastor, George Agajanian, I love our policies and procedures. <laughs> but we love our opinions and we, we're quick to comment and we're quick to let everyone know our monologue and what we've been through and what we think. And we can do this as Christians sometimes. We get caught up in our monologue. Some of you have an internal monologue going on right now of things you did last week, last summer, things that are going on in your world, bills that you have to go, you've got to pay and relationships that you need to mend. There's this monologue going on. Even in our world today, we live in that type of culture where it is a monologue. Everyone wants to shout their opinion. Opinion. And I think as Christians, I wanted to encourage us today to bring dialogue to the table, to not just get caught up in our, our monologue, in what we think and our opinions, but let's have dialogue with people. You see, everyone today has a megaphone. Do you remember the street preachers that used to stand on the corner? I mean, I know they're still around today, but they're, you know, the street preachers, they're the megaphone and they're yelling at everyone, hell, fire and brimstone, and people are just walking by not listening to anything. And I think this is what we can do sometimes when we yell out on the microphone or the microphone or the megaphone and we can yell out our opinions and what we believe and what should happen and this that should happen. Sometimes what we've got to do is put the megaphone down, step off the platform and go and have a conversation and dialogue with people and cross the road and talk to your neighbours, talk to your employees, talk to people. Have dialogue with people. You and I were called to have dialogue. Ephesians 4, 29 says this, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that, that it may benefit those who listen. See, monologues can isolate you. Monologues can completely isolate you. I dare you to try to have a monologue in your marriage. Trust me, it doesn't work. I tried it this week. <laughs> monologues, they don't work. You get caught up in what you think and everything you've done and it's about me and everything that's going on. And have you ever noticed, like side note, when you've walked away from, we call them debate in our families, when you walked away from the debate and you, you isolate yourself, everything seems to make sense when you're by yourself. Like everything's justified. Everything you said, yeah, that is right. Because I tell you what, you are always right when you are by yourself. Why? Because yourself agrees with yourself. Right? That's why Proverbs 18.1 says, whoever isolates himself, seeks his own desire, he breaks out against all sound judgment. But how many of you know we were called to be a part of community and we were created to be a part of family and we were created to have connection with people and dialogue with people and have conversations. And, and, and conversations doesn't mean you agree with someone, but at least it makes space to listen to someone else and listen to their heart and get their perspective. But sometimes what we do is we love our monologues. 
We love our monologues. We get caught up in our own monologue, but monologues, they isolate you. Imagine as a church, if we got caught up in our monologues, if we got caught up in just what we do and we never actually got out there in the community. Over in the 8 a.m., it was beautiful. We saw all these green shirts just out there and they were our city care street teams. And it represented to me, man, I love that because they're people who step outside the church and they, they go and they have conversation and they dialogue and they serve people and they love people and they show kindness because it is about not us getting caught up in our monologue. I believe we're called to be the Ephesians 1.23 church. The church you see is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. I know the church is set apart. We are chosen. The kingdom is called to advance. God is building his church. But every now and then, man, we gotta be a part of dialogue. We gotta be a part of the conversations. I know as a pastor, as a youth pastor, as a minister of the gospel, I wanna be a part of some of society's tough topics right now in high schools, when it comes to bullying, when it comes to anxiety, when it comes to dating, when it comes to sex and sexuality, why? Because the kingdom of God has got something to say. I'm not gonna just leave it to everyone else's opinion and blog.com, no, no, we gotta be a part of the conversation. Monologues and dialogues. You see, I like this illustration, um, it was between um, the US Navy and Canadian authorities. I'll read you a transcript and I think it clearly illustrates sometimes what we can do with our monologues. The Americans were sailing and the the American, uh, US Navy, US Navy, Americans, same thing. Um, They were sailing and they radioed this to the Canadian authorities. Please divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid collision. The Canadians responded with, uh, we recommend you divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid a collision. The Americans then Radio back and said, this is the captain of the US Navy ship. Sorry, that's the youth pastor coming out in me. I say again, divert your course, Canadian authorities. No, I say again, you divert your course. This is the aircraft carrier, USS Lincoln, the second large ship in the United Atlantic fleet. Three destroyers, three cruisers, and numerous support vessels accompany us. I demand that you change your course 15 degrees north, that's one five north, or countermeasures will be undertaken to ensure the safety of this ship. Change your course now. The Canadians responded with, this is a lighthouse, your call buddy. nudge the American next to you and go, classic American, my goodness. (laughs) But this is what we do. We get caught up in what we have, our qualifications and everything that we've done and everything that we've been through, our certificates and my opinion, so you should listen and everything like that, not knowing that we're headed for collision ahead. We do that with people. It's hard to connect with people. There's always a blockage because we're just caught up in our own monologues and what we think and our opinion. But sometimes we even do this with God. We go, we get caught up in God. You need to change your course. This needs to happen. This, change this relationship. Change that, change that. And God's saying, no, no, you, you need to change. I'm an immovable object. I'm the unshakable. I'm the lighthouse. And you need to move and change your course. If not, you are headed for the, the, the collision. And so what you need to understand is we've got to have conversation. We have to have dialogue. Exodus 3, do you remember Moses? He was in the desert for 40 years. He was wandering the desert, caught up in his own monologue of 40 years. Fugitive. He didn't know whether he was a Hebrew or whether he was a son of the Pharaoh. He didn't know he had murdered people. He was, he was on the run and he was caught up in his monologue, yet God called out in Exodus 3 from the burning bush, Moses, take off your sandals, take off your opinions, take off everything that you've been creating, take off your monologues and step onto holy ground and step on. And what happens in that beautiful cap- portion of verse, verses is they had a, a beautiful conversation and God calls him through dialogue. You fast forward to Exodus 33, the Lord, 33 verse 11, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks with a friend. Which says to me, we serve a God that wants to have dialogue and conversation with you. We have a God and we serve a God who wants to dialogue and have face to face conversation with you. This is not a message just for the extroverts. This is not a message just for people who love conversation, 
who are the life of the party. I don't know what that was, but we love, we, we, this is not, no, no, this is a message for every single person because each and every one of us does desire community. Each and every one of us desire connection. Each and every one of us desire to be heard. Each and every one of us desire to say something. And guess what? Dialogue does that. It causes us to have conversations. It causes us to meet people where they're at. It causes us to get off our pedestal and go and just speak with people. I love what Bob Goff was saying. Go and love your enemies. Cross the road and just go and start a conversation with them because it's perhaps a conversation conversation that could change something today. It's a conversation that could change your life today. Maybe it's a conversation with an employee because they keep turning up late. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's dialogue with where are we going to live. Maybe it's dialogue in your marriage of how do we take this marriage forward. Maybe it's dialogue of let's have a baby. Maybe it's a conversation with your offspring about how babies came about the birds and the bees. Anyway. You see, although it can be awkward, confronting, nerve-wracking, guess what? Dialogue transforms. Dialogue transforms. You see, dialogue is an adventure, an adventure available to anyone. And sometimes it's an adventure whose outcome can change the world. I wanna take you to a portion of Scripture in John 4, and I love the book of John, and particularly this conversation that happens in John 4, verse 1. Verse 1 to 42, this is Jesus' longest recorded conversation. It's the story of the woman at the well. I love the book of John because John has this writing style that shows us light and shade, showing Jesus being the light in the darkness. And he uses contrasting uh, stories. In John chapter three, Jesus has another conversation. It's a story with Nicodemus. Now notice Nicodemus, he is an elite. He's, a, he's, he's high up there. He knows what he's talking about, kind of like the theologian of the day. Jesus meets with him when? In the middle of the night. He comes and he has a conversation and that conversation results in Nicodemus kind of frustrated and walking away back to his same community. Then you go to John chapter four. Do you see what John does there? Ch John chapter three. And then you go to John chapter four and now Jesus contrasts it with Jesus has a conversation. He goes to a place called Samaria. Jews did not deal with Sam Samaritans. And he has a conversation with who? An unnamed woman. You did not have a conversation, let alone being Jew and Samaritan, you did not have a conversation with a, a, a woman, a woman particularly, in this case, with a reputation. But you see, John shows that Jesus talks to everyone and anyone. He talks to John chapter three, the elite, but he also crosses the boundaries of, of racism. He crosses the boundaries of, of prejudice and he steps beyond the boundaries, why? To reach people. And let that be a word for each and every one of us today is that God will reach you. He'll break every rule. He'll break every boundary to meet you where you're at because why? He's a God that wants to connect with you and have face-to-face -face contact with you. You see, the monologue of the day would have been excluded to that woman, but dialogue with Jesus said included. You see, the monologue of that day would have said six, uh, five, six husbands, but Jesus' dialogue said, no, one man, and you've been looking for him. I will complete you. I am Jesus. I am him. And I praise God that we can have a conversation with God no matter where we're from, no matter what background, no matter what we've been through, no matter what you've been doing. He wants to have a conversation and he will leave the chasm of heaven and earth and come to have a conversation with you and me. Why? Because he loves you. Now, back to John 4. Jesus is talking in John 4 with this woman. The, the, a, a long conversation that is happening here. And we're gonna take it from verse four and we're gonna kind of peruse through it. And it's this. Now, he had to go to Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar. Is that how you say it? Sychar? Sike. Anyway. Near the plot of ground Jacob had, uh, had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. Again, John shows us he was fully man, being tired and hungry. And then later on, you're gonna see that he's fully God because he acknowledges supernaturally who this woman really is. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Jesus said to her, if only you knew, girl. Again, classic youth pastor, sorry. 
You would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman replied, you have nothing to draw uh, uh, with and the well is deep. Where, where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also his son and his livestock? Jesus then says, anyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But basically he's saying, but anyone who drinks of the water that I have to offer will never thirst again. Verse 15, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. She was trying to avoid, you would go and fetch water in in the cool of the day during the early morning hours, but obviously she had been trying to avoid society because there's probably monologues going on about her, about what she represented. So she turns up and she's trying to avoid society and she turns up and instead she finds a man. I think it's important to note as well that in wells in Bible times also uh, were conversation points. It's where you came to connect with people, whether you wanted to connect with someone else, but you would meet. But she probably came, many scholars say, to avoid, but I wonder if she came to possibly meet another man. But she came and she met Jesus instead and had her life radically changed. But catch this, sir, the woman said, I can see. So Jesus calls out this uh, conversation where he says, "Uh, look, you you got five husbands and and, and you got... But the, the guy you're with right now, he's not really your husband. He, he, he acknowledges supernaturally who he is, fully God. He knows what's going on. Catch this. She goes, uh, I see that you are a prophet. I see that you're a prophet. And then it goes on in, sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet in verse 19. And then catch this, verse 20, she full on changes the subject. She goes, she goes from talking about everything that she's been going through and then she goes, um, our ancestors worshipped on the mountain, but you Jews claim that the place... See how she just changes the subject on Jesus because it's probably getting a bit uncomfortable, but yet still Jesus goes on and he doesn't even point out all her mistakes. He doesn't point out everything that she's done, even though he probably knew. He still just has dialogue. And as this dialogue happens, she figures out that he is the Christ. She goes back to her community and she changes her community through this one conversation that she had with Jesus. Jesus. I just want to give us four points, a pattern that Jesus sets for us that I believe we can follow this morning and apply to our life when it comes to dialogue. You ready? Dialogue, write this down, dialogue brings response. You see, notice in this conversation, see, monologues, they they don't demand any response. Dialogue demands a response. It demands you being interactive and and asking questions. Notice this, in verse nine, she says, she starts with, you're a Jew. But then verse 11, she progresses to, sir. Then verse nine, prophet. Then verse 26, she then realises Christ which is John's major theme, is he's trying to show people this is the Christ. He, in John 6, you'll later on see that he is the bread of life. John is trying to show this is the guy you've been waiting for. And so she progresses, but she starts with Jude. You see, that only happened through conversation and dialogue. Guess what? Dialogue brings response. Response brings progress. Progress brings transformation. Do you know one of the ways my four-year-old will develop in his life and develop and learn is if, I have dialogue with him and have conversations with him. Recently, we had a conversation with Jack Four and uh, we just started talking about the whole Jesus thing in his life. We're like, Jack, do you know Jesus? And he's like, oh no, daddy, my heart's broken. I was like, what? I'm like, my heart's broken. I'm like, well, guess what? Do you know Jesus can come and live in your heart and he can, he can heal your heart? He's like, no, Jesus, no, 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 daddy. Only Batman can do that. How many of you know I've got a few uh, conversations to have in order for him to progress? Let him know it's not Batman that can rescue, it's actually Jesus. But you apply that to our life. I, you know what, I, what I'm saying is, you wanna, you wanna see your life progress when it comes to your Christianity, when it comes to your faith. Have dialogue with people. Have some conversations with people. Don't get stuck in monologue or what you learned when you were a kid. No, have dialogue with people because dialogue brings progress. You know, one of the ways that someone identified the, the call of God in my life, they didn't just come to me and go, hey, there's a gift on your life and then walk away. No, they identified it, then they had conversations conversations with me. They had a dialogue with me. They called out my strengths. They called out my weaknesses. Do you know how I got to know the Word of God more and more? It's through conversation, through a Bible study, through connect group, a dialogue, because I could have got caught up in a verse that I didn't understand and ah, monologue, ah, that's not for me. No, instead, I planted myself in a Bible study group and I got to dialogue with others about what they thought of the verse and bringing perspective to their, to their life. You see, dialogue brings progress. But instead, what we do, we have one bad experience at church. Someone stole your car park. 
That did happen, didn't it? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, someone took your seat. Sorry if that was you. No one said hello to you in the front foyer. And guess what? Many Christians around the world make a monologue from that one bad experience. This is not the church for me. And they walk away. But guess what? Progress and moving forward in church life or in any community comes through dialogue. Conversations with other people. What conversations do you need to have today? Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Dialogue brings response. Response brings progress. Progress brings transformation. Second thing is this, write this down. Dialogue brings revelation. She realises, she gets a revelation in verse 26, I, the one, am speaking to you. She only got this through dialogue and conversation. Um, I don't know if you've ever written a song, whether you're writing a message, writing a book, whether you're creating and innovating something, but have you ever faced what is, is called writer's block? Do you know that? Where you, you, you just, you, there's a blockage in creativity, there's a blockage in, 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 in like, and you're just stuck and you don't know. Or, or have you ever felt like, your passion was wane and in terms of it's, it's just decreased and you feel like you don't have passion for this more? Have you ever felt like um, maybe uh, you felt dry in your spirit? You feel like, oh, I don't know anymore and I'm not as passionate as I used to be. Well, whenever I face writer's block in my world, maybe preparing a message, passion for young people, if ever I find myself not being passionate or I feel like I have writer's block, do you know one of the most powerful things I can do is stop what I'm doing, go for a walk in the church foyers, and have conversation and dialogue with people. It is fascinating to me, God drops revelation when I simply dialogue with people. Maybe some of you are experiencing life block. Maybe you're experiencing marriage block. Maybe you're experiencing business block. Maybe you just experience a big blockage wherever you go in your life. Maybe it's time to have a church walk in the church foyers and dialogue. Or maybe it's time to just walk the streets of our broken humanity and just dialogue with people and talk with people and find out where people are at instead of making a monologue of, nah, this is not gonna work. This is not gonna be something that is gonna help people. Go for a walk and you'd be fascinated that revelation drops because someone else brings perspective to your situation. Someone else, uh, when you interact with them, drops revelation and God speaks to you. You see, this woman had a revelation because she had dialogue. Imagine if Jesus turned up and said, monologue, nah, not talking to you. You're a woman, you're a Samaritan, can't see you later. Monologue, that's the monologue. No, instead, Jesus breaks the boundaries and he dialogues with her and he has a conversation and he, she has a, a revelation of who he is. Dialogue brings revelation. Get this, write this down. Third thing, dialogue brings restoration. It's in having a conversation with Jesus, her life is restored. Verse 15, sir, give me this water so that I won't have to keep coming here to draw water. She's searching, she's looking, she's trying to avoid everyone. I don't wanna come here anymore because I have to go through these conversations with other people and their monologue on me is not really true or if it is true, it, it makes me feel awkward. Yet Jesus keeps having this dialogue with her and she, be, she is restored through dialogue. I've said this from this platform before, but I check in um, every now and then to someone professional that knows a little bit more about me, particularly when it comes to mindset, thinking, how our brains work and everything. Some of you already look at me because there's a stigma that comes with that going, you crazy. But the truth is, the same way you get your car serviced is the same way I think we need to get ourselves serviced because I just know the way I'm wired. And so I don't see someone because anything's wrong because there isn't. I see someone because I want to make sure things don't go wrong in our life. And I think it's important every now and then to dialogue, whether it's with a trusted mentor or whether it's with someone professional or whether it's with someone further down the track, when they, uh, whether it's someone that has godly counsel. Notice I said godly counsel. There's a lot of counsel out there. Godly counsel and have a conversation and dialogue. Why? Because dialogue will bring restoration. So maybe in your marriage, you know you need to get some help. Maybe it's time to start those conversations. Maybe in, in knowing your Bible more. Maybe it's time to get planted in a Bible study in a group of people and start to have some dialogue because as you dialogue, you are restored. Notice in this story, Jesus restores her through dialogue. He doesn't really turn up and go, Hunda, Shunda, you are healed. No, he heals her through dialogue, conversation. The last point is this, the team can come and join me, is this, dialogue brings revival. Bit of a church plug. That's why I love this Cross Equals Love campaign. I love it because 
It's more than content, images to look cool, and billboards here and there. It's a conversation starter. Someone's hanging out their clothes, they see cross equals love. Oh man, conversation starter right there. You see, the more we dialogue with people and have conversations with people rather than make a monologue in society like, oh, they're all headed for hell. No, have conversations. Watch what happens when you bring the love of Jesus and kindness. Notice Jesus doesn't call out her faults. He doesn't call out her mistakes. He has dialogue with her and it's the longest, at least in the English version, the longest recorded conversation dialogue. Watch what happens. She runs away in verse 39. She goes and tells her community. Revival. This is probably the first report of an evangelist in the Bible. She's probably the first reported evangelist because she goes and she witnesses to people and tells her about everything that she had experienced in dialogue. We're all called to be evangelists. We're all called to be light in, this, in, in the world. We're all called to go and have conversations and dialogue with people. And like I said, every now and then, we gotta put down the megaphone and step down and have conversations with people. Watch what happens when she dialogues with people. Watch this. In verse 42, John 4, 42, they said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the saviour of the world. I heard it said like this, they'll come into the kingdom because of you and conversations and dialogue because of you, but they'll stay because of Jesus. Imagine if we stepped out this week and had those conversations, those, that dialogue that needs to happen. Maybe it's with a teenager, dialogue needs to happen. I have some friends that are mentors of mine who, I love it because when they came to parenting teenagers, they had a conversation with their teenagers about, hey, I... I've never been a parent of teenagers before and they dialogued. Instead of just getting caught up in a monologue of, no, just do this, do this, but they, they, they had a conversation and conversation brought transformation to their teenagers and dialogue. Maybe it's dialogue with an employee. Maybe it's dialogue with your business, customers, your employees. Maybe it's dialogue in your marriage of how do we take our marriage forward. Maybe there's a conversation waiting to happen. Imagine what could happen when you step out and have conversation instead of being caught up in our monologues it could change the world it could change the world dialogue I'll finish here I think Colossians 4 5 to 6 sums what I'm talking about I think it sums it up beautifully be wise in the way you act toward outsiders make the most of every opportunity let your conversation, your dialogue, be always what? Full of grace, seasoned, salt bay with salt. You guys don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so that you may know how to answer everyone. Full of grace, seasoned with salt, bringing flavor to this world. If we put down the megaphone and dialogue with people and dialogue with God, because guess what? He wants to dialogue with you in Jesus' name. Come on, why don't you give God a hand of praise? <laughs> Father, I thank You so much for what You're doing here. Lord, only You know what's really going on in people's hearts, in their minds. Dialogue needs to take place. First of all, God, dialogue needs to happen with You. I thank You that You are not a monologue God. God, You are a dialogue God. You wanna have conversation with us. And I pray right now you would just speak as we listen. But God, your heart is that we can speak as well and you listen. So Father, right now, change us, speak to us. Things that need to happen, dialogue, conversations, God, monologues, internal monologues that are happening in people's minds right now. Father, I pray that you would get rid of them and dialogue. In Jesus' Name. Would you stand with me, church? I'm gonna let the team just worship for a moment. We've still got a few moments in this service and I wanna pray for one more group of people. Come on, let's worship together in Jesus' Name. Thanks, Ben. And as you speak A hundred billion faces disappear Where you lost your life so I could find it if you left the grave behind you, so will I. I can see your heart and everything you've done. 
I hand it back to Joel and the team, just wanted to pray one more prayer. And uh, it's for anyone here that has never known Jesus as their Lord and their Saviour, walked in this place, maybe a friend, family member brought you, and you feel like you don't know this Jesus that we're talking about. Well, well friend, guess what? He knows you. He knows about you. He created you. He knows everything that's going on in your world. And He wants to live in your life this morning. You see, we live in a world that has boiled religion down to just rules, regulation, monologue, a set of rules, no conversation. But Christianity is actually about relationship. And relationship takes dialogue, conversation. Guess what? He speaks to you and we listen, but we also get to speak and He listens. This is the power of Christianity and relationship with Jesus. And maybe you have a monologue of religion and maybe you grew up in church and you find yourself here and maybe you got a monologue going on of mistakes and sin and things going on in your world. Well, friend, God wants to dialogue with you this morning and He wants to give His Son Jesus. He gave His Son Jesus 2,000 years ago to die on this world, to come and dialogue and restore people, change people like that woman at the well. And He wants to give you eternal life this morning. I'd love to lead you in a simple, powerful prayer of asking Jesus to be the Lord and the Saviour of your life. You're saying, yeah, Peter, I I, I don't really know Him. Or maybe one time you made a decision and you walked away from Him. Friend, He never walked away from you. Or maybe you've never really prayed a prayer to ask Jesus into your heart. Well, this morning is your morning. Give your life to Him. Can I have every head bowed, every eye closed all over this place? Every man, every woman, whoever's watching through the stream and the link, anyone in the foyers, anyone in the parenting room, stop still for a moment. Here's my question. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Saviour? If you don't, I would love to lead you in a simple, powerful prayer right where you stand. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna count to three. When I count to three, just raise your hand high enough and long enough for me to see it and I'll include you in this prayer right where you stand. You won't have to come up here or anything, do anything crazy. No, you just stand right there and I'm gonna lead you in this prayer. You ready? If you're saying, yeah, Peter, pray for me. I wanna have a conversation with this God. I wanna start my dialogue. I wanna have a relationship with Him. And this morning is your morning. You ready? One, two, three. Raise your hands all over this place. Yeah, I'm sure through the screens there, people are raising their hands. Yeah, people are identifying with Jesus right now. It's incredible, amazing. God's doing a good work. This is so good. I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Even if you didn't raise your hand, but you know that you should have, repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, Jesus I ask that you would come and live in my life. That you come and live in my life. I choose you now Jesus. and forevermore. And forevermore. I, surrender I surrender all. Forgive me. Forgive me. I need you, I need you. right now. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Come on, let's applaud those that have made a decision. Before I hand it back to the team, uh, listen, um, if you just made that decision, maybe you raised your hand or maybe you didn't, but you know that you should have. Uh, Upon exit right now in the foyer that you walked in or you're about to walk out of, there's gonna be someone holding up this Bible. It's a gift. It's a gift on behalf of our church to mark this day. It's a special day. It's a newborn, the day that you decided to be born again. And we wanna uh, gift you with this Bible. And it's a beautiful, beautiful Bible. And there's a card on the back there that we want you to fill out. We give away hundreds of these every weekend. Please don't walk away. Maybe you know a friend or a family member that prayed that prayer. Hey, why don't you walk up to the person for them and say, we need one of these Bibles. We, We prayed that prayer. Start some dialogue, start some conversation. And this is just helps us have a conversation with you about being more connected into community, to the things of God, your purposes in, 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 in this world, amen. Come on, why don't we congratulate all those people again. <laughs> Hand it back to Joel, amen. That was awesome, Pete. That was amazing. Great job. Monologues and dialogues. It's so easy as a Christian after a while to slip into a monologue even with the Lord. And we've got some space still, some minutes. Why don't we keep worshipping the Lord to sing that song through again and take this moment as you're singing, not just to sing it one way. Let's not worship monologue. Let's allow this moment to create dialogue 
with the Lord. Let's worship Him and allow Him to draw near to us. Come on, let's do this together. The stars were made to worship so alive. If the mountains bow and rest so alive. If the oceans roll your grave, so so much for what you're doing in our lives. Lord, we ask you to help us this week as we go from here to enter more deeply into dialogue with you, not just go through Bible readings and just our prayers and just do the religious thing in a monologue way, but to engage with you. Transform us, God. Change us. Help us this week. Be in dialogue with you in Jesus' name. Amen. That was awesome, Peter. That's great. Thank you, Mr. Laura. <laughs> that was fantastic. Listen, a couple of things before we leave. Uh, tonight, Sanger is preaching. Sanger is coming down from Newcastle. So he'll be both in the epicenter at five and here in the convention center at six. Um, there's the Easter things that are happening next weekend. These are on your seats. They're like little invite cards where trying to help you to create that dialogue with friends and family and people at work and around the streets. And the idea is to get this out. Easter next weekend. Let me tell you a couple of things about Easter. Uh, Friday morning, church. Sunday morning, church. Sunday is the end of Daylight Savings. Okay, so next weekend's a little bit different. We've got Friday morning, Good Friday. We've got the uh, one hour communion services. Sunday morning, we've got Resurrection Sunday morning services. Water baptisms on Sunday. If you've not been baptised yet, spread the word. Let's get that happening Sunday morning. And um, so, so great. It's the normal service times, 8, 9, 11, 15 on Friday and on Sunday. And there's no church next Sunday night. It's just Easter. Go and spend time with family and friends. So that's Easter. Next weekend, we're all in. 
Let me tell you one thing that's happening straight after this and every weekend. It's a class we call Engage and it's where we can have a dialogue with you, right? We actually want to have a conversation and it's all about next steps. So if you've just given your life to Jesus today, Engage is the perfect place. If you're new to our church, Engage is the perfect place. If you want to find more about our church or get connected or get serving and helping and doing something, Engage. So find that class out there in the foyers. That's for you. And we'll see you tonight. Sanger, let me pray for you. It's going to be incredible. Father, thank You. Thank You that You want a conversation with us. Thank You that You started the conversation. And thank You that You're always there. You never leave us. You never forsake us. We can always come to You. We can cast our cares on You. We can talk to You about anything. Lord, we ask this week that You would empower those conversations in Jesus' Name. Bless Your people, Lord. Amen. Amen. Love you. Thanks for being in church. We'll see you tonight. You love singing songs. Face to face with my God, lost in you.